Hello, I'm uh, Jose Pereira and I'm professor in the Faculty of Medicine and the Institute for Culture and Society at the University of Navarra in Spain. I'm also professor in the Division of Palliative Care in the Department of Family Medicine at McMaster University in Canada and scientific advisor and co-founder of Pallium Canada. And my hope is to share with you in a relatively short presentation a very quick overview about the status of primary palliative care in Canada and also about our work in Pallium Canada. For the purposes of this presentation, I will be using the term primary palliative care to refer to palliative care provided by healthcare professionals and services that are not specialized in palliative care, but that with core palliative care skills can provide a palliative care approach to their patients with serious illnesses. I will first provide some important context and then move over to a quick overview of the state of primary palliative care. And then in the third part, look at the work we're doing and with Pallium Canada and then conclude. It is important to recognize that Canada is a very large country. It's the world's second largest country. And in fact, you can fit France and Spain together into one of its provinces, namely Ontario. There are 38 million inhabitants and about 80% of them live within 200 to 300 kilometers of the southern border with the United States. And that is because the further north you go, the more rural, remote and isolated it becomes. Canada has got 14 healthcare systems because there are 10 different provinces and three different uh, territories and each of them have got their own healthcare ministries and they organize healthcare differently across those different uh, provinces, territories and sub-regions. So one sees a fair amount of variation across the country in terms of, for example, primary care models and palliative care services, funding for palliative care uh, done by family practices and also funding towards palliative care services and resources. In addition, many of these provinces have got sub-regions and we also see variation between these sub-regions. So for example, in the province of Ontario, um, in the city of Hamilton, most of the family doctors provide primary palliative care and the uh, the mandate of the specialist palliative care team in the community is to support them. Whereas in another city like Toronto or uh, Kitchener-Waterloo, the palliative care community team will take over all the palliative care and provide both primary level palliative care as well as specialist level palliative care. And that's all within one province. We've seen significant improvements in the integration of palliative care in the medical school curricula. We see it also in the curricula of residents training to be family physicians or residents in other specialty areas. And we've seen that across the 17 medical schools of the country. However, only 30% of medical students in 2016-2017 completed palliative care rotations and palliative care rotations are obligatory in only two schools and optional in 13. At McMaster University, for example, about one third of the 200 medical students a year will opt to undertake a palliative care rotation. In postgraduate training, um, in 2016-2017, about 58% of family medicine trainees completed palliative care rotations. And when they were asked at the end of their training um, whether they would be providing palliative care as part of their practices, between 38% to 85% of them said yes, they would. So the variability is interesting and it raises the question why in some schools it's so low and and in other schools, what are they doing to increase that number? Because the number should, I would argue, be around 80-85%. So where are we at now in terms of palliative care being provided by non-specialist palliative care teams across the country? Again, a lot of variability across the provinces and their sub-regions. In some provinces, like Alberta, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick and Prince Edward Island, uh, there's very strong provision by family physicians of uh, primary palliative care, often with the support of specialist palliative care teams. 
in other provinces, however, such as in Ontario, it's variable across the subregions. And I gave you some examples earlier. Um, in one particular region, for example, that we reviewed recently, about six or eight years ago, the uh, palliative care team in the community started taking over providing all the palliative care within that um, region, including primary and specialist level palliative care. And they've reached a point now where they're absolutely exhausted. Um, and in the interim, the primary care teams have become disempowered to provide palliative care, and they now feel uncomfortable to do so. And the pandemic has made them also exhausted and has thinned out uh, 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 the primary care capacity in that region in general. So facing quite a challenge to build up primary palliative care in that particular region. In rural regions across the Canada, family physicians um, are responsible for providing the bulk of palliative care. But unfortunately, as we'll see shortly, the level of training is often lacking to provide palliative care. But again, and I want to emphasize this, there have been significant improvements over the last 20 years. And I'm proud to say that Pallium Canada has helped make some of those um, improvements over the years. Interestingly, in Canada, there's a very big move towards the paramedics. So the first respondents, the ambulance folks providing primary palliative care. And we're seeing some spectacular results across the country with reduced um, emergency admissions, amongst others. There's variability across the country in terms of the preparedness of home care agency staff. Some home care agencies are role models in that they insist and ensure they provide primary palliative care training to all their staff. In other cases, that's not the situation. And again, the pandemic has heightened the challenges in the home care sector. The pandemic also exposed many gaps across the whole system, but especially in nursing homes. So there's laws now in place that, that require the integration of primary palliative care uh, within the care in nursing homes or long-term care facilities, as we call them. There are still gaps um, across the country in terms of the preparedness of general practices to provide primary palliative care. This was a study published a few years ago of several OECD countries. And when general practices were asked if they were ready to provide palliative care, in Canada, only 42% of them said that they were prepared to provide palliative care. And we can explore the reasons for it. Some of it relates to lack of training. Some of it also relates to lack of resources or remuneration to allow them to provide primary palliative care and do home visits, among others. In this very large survey of primary care practices in the provinces of Ontario and in eastern Quebec, we asked practices whether they were providing primary palliative care. Most of them said that they would be providing palliative care to those patients who came walking into the clinic, so the ambulatory patients. However, um, a much smaller proportion were actually providing primary palliative care themselves. 44% of the practices, for example, in Ontario, were saying that they hand over all the palliative care, and that includes both primary level and specialist palliative care, to specialist palliative care teams. And that's where I think there's a big uh, challenge, there's a big problem, because if we continue this way and that number increases, um, I would argue that it would be unsustainable that all the palliative care is delivered only by specialist palliative care teams. We need both. So a few words about Pallium Canada and its approach. Pallium Canada was founded formally in 2000, although we had done concept testing back in 1997 and 99, particularly with online learning to rural based clinicians and also classroom based um, retreat style uh, training. The mission is to build primary palliative care capacity across professions primary care and specialty areas and across care settings. And a lot of the work is done through the LEAP Learning Essential Approaches to Palliative Care courseware. We've published our work, so I would refer you to the British Medical Journal uh, to, in 2021. So that's the British Medical Journal Support of Palliative Care. In 2021, we published a summary of our work over the years, the factors that we 
feel have helped it succeed, the challenges and um, examples of spread and scale up. We have a suite of over 20 courses with different versions, some of them like the LEAP core for primary care teams or LEAP mini for primary care teams, LEAP paramedics for paramedics, but there are also versions for uh, clinicians, healthcare professionals working uh, in hospitals, working in nursing homes, uh, clinicians caring for patients with advanced kidney disease, with uh, lung diseases as in leap lung and heart diseases as in leap heart and most of these have got classroom versions fully online versions and hybrid versions and available both in english and in french in 2014 2015 2016 for example we rolled out leap renal across all the renal services so that includes hemodialysis programs um, across the province of ontario this map shows um, all the courses delivered across Canada in 2019. There were 560 LEAP courses delivered, and these are delivered by facilitators across the country. We have a pool of about 700 certified, trained facilitators. Most of them are palliative care doctors and nurses. And we've trained about 900,000 learners in 2019 alone across the whole country, including way up into quite remote uh, communities in the north. During the pandemic, we saw actually an increased demand for training, especially in uh, nursing homes or long term care homes, but as well in community settings. And this was the map in 2021 of all the courses delivered across the country. Um, this actually shows where the learners were because the courses were all delivered um, through virtual learning, online learning because of the restrictions imposed by the pandemic. We've been studying the impact of the courses, and this is a study that we published in Palliative Medicine last year, and I would encourage you to read the paper. It's looking at whether learners, four months after they'd finished the course, were implementing changes in their practices, and the top changes that they were implementing were early initiation of palliative care, better uh, advanced care planning and goals of care discussions, increased use of screening tools to assess the needs of patients, better use of opioids and medications, and improved pain and symptom management and grief and bereavement care. While training is absolutely essential, it by itself does not uh, suffice. It's not by itself sufficient. So we have done programs where we've combined training with other strategies to integrate a palliative care approach um, in other words, primary palliative care, both in primary care clinics and in cancer centers. And our results of those have shown significant increase in palliative care knowledge, identification of patients with palliative care needs and improved advanced care planning and goals of care discussions and also transitions of care. On the theme of going beyond just training, we're also connecting the training with quality improvement and the use of quality improvement approaches, such as uh, the model for improvement and the PDSA cycles. We're developing a series of toolkits uh, to help practices or long-term care homes to integrate palliative care in different ways. This is an example of a particular toolkit. They are called Quick. Um, uh, and that's quality improvement condensed and they take the users step by step through the key uh, uh, processes and steps of um, effecting change and then replicating it and making it stick and stay. In conclusion and looking ahead, there is variability across provinces and their sub-regions with respect to the extent to which primary care and clinicians um, in different specialty areas are providing a palliative care approach or primary palliative care. That we've seen significant improvements over the last two decades, particularly around the presence and access to palliative care specialist services, but also in the delivery of primary palliative care across different um, uh, care settings and services. But there's still many gaps and a lot of work is still needed to get us to the tipping point. In some areas, we've reached the tipping point, for example, with the paramedics, where it's now become almost normal practice uh, to do primary palliative care. We look forward to a future where we've reached the tipping point across 
the primary care sector, across all hospital services, across long-term care homes, where palliative care is an integral part of the care that they provide and that there are specialist palliative care services that they can turn to for help. Thank you very much.